I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from Ukraine and Europe, discuss the new front in Russia's war on the West, and we speak to author and translator Jonathan Campion about his book on the inspiring and moving story of Ukrainian cricket. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody is going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Friday the 7th of June, two years and 105 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our Brussels correspondent, Joe Barnes, and author and translator, Jonathan Campion. I started by summarising the latest news from Ukraine. It's been another night of drone attacks across Ukraine. The Ukrainian military are claiming they shot down 48 out of 53 drones launched by Russia overnight, as well as five missiles fired during the attack. The Kyiv region was targeted with drones and KH-101 and KH-555 missiles, sparking a fire in an industrial facility. That's according to the governor. In Kharkiv, drones knocked out windows from at least three residential buildings and damaged other local infrastructure Three drones were eliminated over Dnipropetrovsk, and the Helmitsky governor also reported no damage, saying the Air Force shot down 11 targets over his region. Finally, the Ukrainian military said seven drones were shot down over Odessa, three more in Kherson, and two more in Mykolaiv. Moving out of Ukraine, then Joe Biden has apologised to Volodymyr Zelensky for the way Republican hardliners delayed a $61 billion aid package that was finally pushed through earlier this year. He said... I apologise for the weeks of not knowing what's going to happen in terms of funding because we had trouble getting the bill passed. Biden said this in a meeting at a hotel in Paris on Friday, blaming the delay on, quote, some of our very conservative members. The US president further pledged that his country would stand with Ukraine and announced another $225 million aid package to Kyiv, including more missiles for HIMARS launchers. He told the Ukrainian president that Washington will not walk away from Ukraine. Biden is on a four-day trip to France to commemorate D-Day and attend a state dinner with Emmanuel Macron. But Mr Zelensky's visit has allowed the pair to sit down for a hastily organised bilateral meeting. Remember, earlier this week, Mr Biden struck a blow, this was Joe Barnes reporting, to the Ukrainian leader by revealing he was opposed to the NATOization of Ukraine and would not support moves to bring the country into the alliance. But the passage of the major Ukraine bill through Congress in April does give him funds to distribute. We'll bring you more of this on Monday. Staying in France, Zelensky said today that he hoped a summit hosted by Switzerland this month on bringing peace to Ukraine could hasten a fair end to the conflict. Mr Zelensky told the French Parliament the inaugural peace summit could become a format that would bring closer a just end to this war. I'm grateful for all you were doing, and it is a lot, but for a fair peace, more must be done. He also warned that 80 years after the D-Day landings of World War II, Europe was, quote, Unfortunately, no longer a continent of peace. It is in Ukraine that lies the key to the security of Europe. Because without control on Ukraine, Russia will have to be a normal nation-state and not a colonial empire that is constantly looking for new territory in Europe as well as Asia and Africa. Finally, in France, Emmanuel Macron has said that his country will start selling Mirage 2005 fighter jets to Ukraine by the end of the year. Ukrainian pilots will be trained on French soil for up to six months for this, but Mr Macron did not specify how many of the fighter jets, which are equipped with two 30mm guns and can travel more than twice the speed of sound, would be delivered. The aircraft was first used by the French Air Force in 1984 and deployed during the 1999 Kosovo War during NATO's bombing of Yugoslavia. The 2005 version has upgraded radar systems and can carry fuel drop tanks, which increases its range significantly. Mr Macron said he would propose to Zelensky that the training of pilots should begin by the end of the summer. Moving on, Russia has accused Ukraine of using US-supplied weapons to shell civilian targets and being responsible for the deaths of women and children. Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova claimed on Friday that HIMARS rockets were used in the Belgorod region, that's, of course, bordering Kharkiv. She said fragments of the HIMARS rockets would serve as proof as what had happened. The reports have not been independently verified and there was no immediate comment from Ukraine or the United States. This follows moves by several countries, including Germany and the US, to greenlight Ukraine to use Western-supplied weapons to strike targets inside Russia. Finally, a new poll has found that Ukrainian trust in Vladimir Zelensky has fallen below 60% for the first time since Russia's invasion. It showed that the trust had sunk from about 40% in May 2022 to 59% in May 2024, The Kiev International Institute of Sociology, who ran the poll, said 
We would like to point out that Volodymyr Zelensky still retains legitimacy in the eyes of Ukrainian society, and the majority of Ukrainians continue to trust him. However, the downward trend in trust continues, and can be seen as can be seen from the results. The main reasons for criticism from ordinary Ukrainians are the not always successful staffing policy and issues of justice, in particular in the form of fighting corruption and the fair burden of war for all. To remind ourselves, Mr. Zelensky's first presidential term, which began in 2019, expired last month, but he has remained in post, of course, under martial law. And he said last year he was, quote, ready to hold elections if necessary. Well, those are the updates. Joe Barnes, can I come to you first? There's quite a big story you've been writing about Russia opening a new front in Europe. Tell us why you wrote this and what you found. Hi, folks, and thank you for having me again. I basically started looking at this yesterday in the wake of a Ukrainian-Russian man being arrested just north of Paris. While being a Ukrainian-Russian from the Donbass, he was and had served as a Russian soldier for two years and then somehow found his way to Paris and acquired what investigators described a load of bomb making materials and he was a burn after his explosives exploded and then he was arrested in his hotel room but what it got me thinking about is almost a proxy with a cold a new cold war we could lean to lots of different descriptions but the escalating confrontation between russia and the west which is what leads people in the west to suggest that we should ready and prepare for hostilities with russia more actively so first if you look at this string of mysterious activity a warehouse in east london being used to supply aid to ukraine it burnt down weeks later an ikea in vilnius lithuania mysteriously caught fire swedish investigators were already looking into the possible that several railway derailments could have been caused by a state-backed saboteur, just one of their lines of inquiry. And then this huge inferno engulfed the largest shopping centre in Warsaw, with Poland's capital. The place is huge, 1,400 shops, and it has literally been razed to the ground. But then suddenly, Donald Tusk, the Polish Prime Minister, started beginning to join the various dots and suggest that the West was under attack by Russian espionage, and this is what he had to say last month. We're examining the threads. They are quite likely that the Russian services had something to do with the Mary Vilska fire. Mary Vilska is the name of the, the shopping centre. And then we can look at various things being cobbled together and start piecemealing it all together. So there's been lots of these incidents escalate and accelerate warnings by European intelligence agency that Russia is plotting acts of sabotage on the continent of Europe and it thrusts those claims into the limelight. So an intelligence assessment which has been shared with Western governments and that I've been made privy to claims that Russia's notorious GRU, that's the military intelligence agency famed for its attacks on foreign soil. You remember the Novichok attacks in Salisbury Farm, English and UK listeners and highly trained agents carrying out attacks on foreign soil. But now it's turning to a network of criminal gangs to carry out these attacks. If we cast our mind back to the beginning of the forced out invasion, February 24, 2022, the Kremlin spy network was dealt this massive blow because countries started expelling intelligence officers who had been operating under cover of being diplomats, and they were expelled about 600 Russian intelligence officers in total. And Britain actually used a similar tactic by expelling Moscow's defence attaché after the alleged Russian-linked arson attack on that East London warehouse, which four men will go on trial for next year, accused of setting fire to the commercial property. Then I started speaking to a few experts. A chap called Alexander Lord is the lead Europe and Eurasia analyst at Sibylin, which is a geopolitical risk firm. And he said, look, the capabilities these gangs can provide are pretty low level, but they can still achieve Russian foreign policy objectives, namely destabilising the West, deterring European decision makers against supporting Ukraine, and exasperating polarisation and societal tensions across not only NATO, but the European Union. So I've looked at the explosives, the fires. There has also been links in France to anti-Semitic graffiti, which the authorities have said, look, could be Russian, another attempt to cause some societal tensions. But what's interesting is the lack of sophistication we're now seeing is a worry for Western intelligence services with these proxies, these criminal gangs being relied on by the Kremlin, now more likely to cause collateral damage. Sifting through various news reports on this, I found a nice quote from the Financial Times, and they quoted a Western counterintelligence officer who said, there is a greater chance of collateral damage and casualties as the proxies are not skilled in tradecraft such as explosives. And yet, look, that theory was completely displayed in public 
when this former Russian soldier was arrested in Paris, which interestingly was not namely connected, we don't know, but it happened at the same time as Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, arrived in France to join those D-Day commemorations. And this trend is has been tracked from the beginning of the year. So I speak to another expert, a gent called Keir Giles, who's a senior consulting fellow at Chatham House, and he described his own assessment to me, and he went, tick, 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 down a list of all the things that have been identified as stuff that Russia would do in advance of a conflict to immobilise Europe. And since then, that pattern has got stronger. And I care. I don't think it has any military purpose other than to destabilise the railways. They carry things. There's been sort of signs of sabotage on Polish railways, which we know are used to transport equipment into Ukraine and people. But there are other actual sort of military targets being targeted. Maybe the, the plots have been derailed, to excuse a pun. So in Germany, two men were arrested for allegedly plotting to blow up a NATO site in the south of the country that is used to support Ukraine. The Russian-German dual citizens were arrested after they were caught carrying out what the Interior Ministry said was surveillance of the US military facility. Poland has arrested a man it said was suspected of helping Russian intelligence prepare an attack on Vladimir Zelensky. Um, as I mentioned, the railways. And then speaking to a Western official yesterday, they said, we are seeing sabotage continue as another ascent of Russian behaviour. And look, those more advanced attack strikes, planned plots, will only raise further suspicion over incidents that have gone so far unexplained, such as a explosion at a BAE systems munitions factory in Wales, which supplies shells to Ukraine, and a similar facility owned by a German firm, Deal. We only have to look at the history of that. Russian agents were blamed for similar attacks on a Czech arms depot in October 2014, where weapons destined for Kyiv were also being stored. Back to our friend and colleague, Alexander Lord. He had to say, if we start to ask ourselves why this is happening now, the discussions in Western capitals around ever-growing Western involvement in Ukraine, I think that what the Russians are seeing is a potential mission creep from them. Over the last two and a half years, we've seen previous red lines being crossed, and the Russians haven't done anything to respond to that. So look, red lines are drawn. We can't send offensive weapons to Ukraine. We started sending them high Mars, started sending them tanks, aircraft. France announced it's trying to send trainers into Ukraine. That's boots on the ground in Ukraine. Russia has not actually escalated the war as it has promised to. So actually, maybe this is its its opportunity to escalate. So NATO, which is vying to play a greater role in the supply of weapons and munitions to Ukraine, has taken a particular interest in these alleged malign acts. So Jens Stoltenberg, Secretary General, recently said, I can say that we have seen increased Russian intelligence activity across the alliance. Therefore, we have increased our vigilance. So that comes across the warnings from top NATO officials that we've got to prepare for war within two decades, and then those timescales drastically shrink to as little as two years from some, mainly the Norwegian chief of defence staff recently. And then then you get these escalated warnings from the Dutch government again. Katja Ollegren, the defence minister, recently told her EU counterparts that electricity supplies, water supplies and undersea infrastructure were particular weak spots in Russia's attempt to intimidate both NATO and the European Union. Um, so Keir Giles, he had this to say, look, it's something that everybody should be aware of because it is another example of Russian hostile activity that seeks to disrupt our countries and could be preparation for something more severe. Um, and it's also raised questions over whether the West is actually capable of handling malign threats from a hostile state after spending so long focusing on counterinsurgency work in the Middle East. So so if you look at how our militaries, our police forces, our intelligence agencies have looked to build themselves around countering threats from Islamic terror groups. Um, and this is what Alexander Lord had to say on that. There are capability gaps in this regard. The focus on counterterrorism post 9-11 was incredibly important, but the relatively benign international situation, aside from the fall of the Soviet Union, has led to an element of complacency that great power, competition and confrontation was a thing of the past. The invasion of Ukraine has radically upended that notion and Western intelligence agencies, police forces, militaries are now scrambling to plug capability gaps considering the severity of the state actor threat. And I'll stop there on that one.
Well, thank you very much, Joe, for talking us through that. A very important story, and I think one that we'll definitely be returning to in the weeks and months to come. Joe, would you just comment and maybe explain for us one final story before we go to our guest? This is something I saw on the Kiev Independent, but it comes originally from the Financial Times, and it's to do with the EU basically pushing to start Ukraine's accession talks before Hungary assumes the bloc presidency in the coming weeks. This is your beat, so I'll hand over to you, Joe. What's happening? So it's something that I've reported on and been speaking to you about quite a few times, but I can actually now say that the Commission has confirmed that Ukraine and Moldova have completed the fourth and third steps to open accession negotiations. So basically, the Commission has said Ukraine is ready to start these talks. So we know Ukraine applied for EU membership a couple of weeks after Russia's launched its invasion and was granted candidate status in December, from memory. (laughs) And it's one of the fastest ever decisions taken by the EU. But we do know that somehow, or we know how it happened, the EU member states um, and the Commission managed to convince Hungary to drop its opposition, its veto, to allowing candidate status. But then that's instantly rose questions of of another veto that Viktor Orban, the Hungarian president, would have over finding proper accession talks because the EU process is very long-winded, a bit daft. You get granted candidate status, then you have to negotiate a sort of a negotiating framework, which then also needs to be agreed. And that's come around. And so I'm told by an EU diplomat just texting me, a large group of member states have expressed support and advocated that the intergovernmental conferences should take place this month. But look, we should start holding talks to get that negotiating framework sorted. I'm told that Hungary noted the commission update and cautioned that it was sticking to 11 points from its non-paper on minorities, so basically rejecting that Ukraine is ready for these talks. And also Hungary said it needed to find some changes in the negotiating framework on minorities. So yeah, it's quite interesting. Why is it happening now? Because Hungary will take over the EU's rotating presidency on July 1st, which means it is in control of setting the agenda on all meetings EU-related, especially so it can use its let's call it disdain for Ukraine, has additional leverage when Ukrainian issues are discussed. So Belgium is the current holder of the EU presidency, so it rotates every six months. And Belgium has been trying to really push ahead to achieve the unanimity needed to hold the first round of accession talks on June the 25th before it hands over to Hungary. So it basically wants to do that really quickly. There was a group of 12 member states that wrote a joint letter the other day asking the commission to start talks and those countries include your normal candidates like poland like germany was in there various other sorts of supporters of ukraine can count the other baltic states so it's a, yeah it's an interesting battle but you've now got the commission and all member states bar hungary on board and we know Hungary sort of opposition is hidden in disguises of it being accused of being pro-Russian and too close to Putin. Often Viktor Orban is described as Putin's uh, closest ally in Europe. So yeah, it's one that they're really trying to start. They're sort of backers, but still, yeah, question marks over the process given Hungary hasn't dropped its opposition. Well, thank you so much, Joe Barnes, for talking us through all of that. It's a great pleasure to welcome our guest, author and translator Jonathan Campion. Jonathan, I've got your book, Getting Out, the Ukrainian cricket team's last stand on the front lines of war in front of me. It's a fantastic read. But before we get into what you found when researching this and writing about it, would you just introduce yourself to our listeners? And also, I think it might be worth just very briefly explaining what cricket is and how it developed originally, because I recognise that lots of our listeners are listening from countries where cricket isn't a sport played much. Jonathan Campion. Thank you. Yes. So I'm a, a writer, translator, and editor. And Ukraine has been a big part of my life for the last, I think, the best part of 20 years. So I used to live there, work there. And since leaving, Ukraine's kind of remained a big part of my life. My son was born there. And for cricket, well, if you don't know, it's quite often described as the the, the British baseball. Uh, It has similar to baseball, a a bat and ball hitting game that's mainly played in the Commonwealth. And why did you decide to write a book about Ukrainian cricket? I think for many listeners, this will seem like a potentially quite a niche subject. So why did you choose it? I think the loveliest supporting story, first of all, when a cricket team in, in the country you think would be the least likely place on earth you'd ever find cricket went from nothing to the very brink of the international stage. So the, the story of Ukrainian cricket is wonderful in a, in a sporting sense. But what makes the book is just how heroic its players were when the, the invasion began. So the cricketers went from 
preparing to become international sports people and celebrating their achievements to Russian tanks appearing in their towns, on their streets, and all of the people involved in Ukrainian cricket did some incredibly heroic things, be it fighting on the front lines, be it distributing humanitarian aid, ev evacuating people from war zones. So the first part of the book is uh, the sporting aspect, and there are some, I think, incredible cricketing stories there. But we learn more about the people when the war begins and really what they're made of and, and just how brave they were. Well, we'll talk about some of those people later, I think. But firstly, could you just give us some background? How did cricket first arrive in Ukraine and how did it develop? Who, who, who are these people that bring this strange new sport to the country? <laughs> so the father of cricket in Ukraine is a man called Hardeep Singh, who arrived in Kharkiv in the early 90s to study. I think as a way to stave off homesickness, wanted to play cricket, cricket again as he had in India growing up. And he went to a Ukrainian carpenter and tried to describe a cricket bat fashioned out of wood. And it all began in a very disorganized way in, in parks in Kharkiv with Indian expats. As Hardeep Singh's kind of businesses grew and he became quite wealthy, he then invested his money and time in, in creating a cricket structure. It spread across the country and uh, before long, the Ukrainians uh, began to play themselves. And that's when the story really began. Well, take us to that moment. I mean, first of all, just tell us, how did Ukrainians react to, to cricket? What do they think was going on? And, and tell us about the, the, the first Ukrainian um, teams out, outside of Kharkiv as well. I think your story about Kharlik CC is especially interesting. That's the one. So uh, every Ukrainian I, I spoke to just said that the moment they saw cricket for the first time, they were so intrigued at what this kind of foreign sport was and what these, you know, the, these foreign people were doing, that their instinct was to just, just go and have a look and ask if they can play themselves. So in Kahalik, which is a, a, a little town about 100 miles outside Kiev, there was an Australian church pastor that was playing there. And they came onto the field and just asked to play and join in. Some people thought that it was some kind of combat because they saw the, the people in, in pads and gloves and wielding cricket bats and thought they were having a fight. But for whatever reason, they just came to, to watch and try out themselves. And before long, Kahalik was the home of Ukraine's first ever Ukrainian native cricket team where all the players were Ukrainian. One of the aspects of your book which I thought was really interesting is the culture shock or the culture clash slightly of when Gahalik, who have been raised by an Australian born coach with Ukrainian ancestry who's the pastor when they start playing some of the teams of foreign born players in Kharkiv and in, and in Kiev. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's such an interesting story about about society and about culture. Yes, it's something that I loved learning about and writing about was that uh, when Kahalik, this team of just Ukrainian young guys began to play against the Indian expats in Kiev who had been playing the whole life and some to a really high standard. It was the ultimate sort of uh, David and Goliath encounter because the Indians were so much stronger. But it was fascinating that just the, the Ukrainians were so determined to give their all and really saw it as a contest and as a matter of pride. And actually when the Indians began to go easy on them, bowl slower, not hit it as far, the Ukrainians got quite annoyed because I think it's just their nature to just to, to want to give their all in any in any contest. So the Indians thought they were doing the Ukrainians a favour by just going easy on them, but the Ukrainians want to, to give it their all. It's a really fantastic story that I really enjoyed reading about that. Let's let's talk then about some of the people. I mean, each one of them I think kind of embodies the, the threads of things like immigration, of what Joe mentioned earlier about the number of students studying in Kharkiv, for example. Can we talk first about Faisal Kasim? Who is he and what's his story? So Faisal Kasim is an Indian medical student and he arrived first in Odessa and then moved to Kharkiv a few years ago um, from India. And back home, he came quite close to becoming a, a professional cricketer, got injured, decided to study and, and chose Ukraine to study. And he not only came to Ukraine, but he, he learned Ukrainian, enjoyed traveling across the country, really became part of Ukraine. And to begin with, enjoyed playing cricket in his free time. But when the war began, it was Faisal who was involved in evacuating his university dorm when the Russian tanks arrived. So the, the, the culture shock of arriving from, from India to Ukraine, he learned the language, truly became part of Kharkiv. And then took it upon himself when the war began to just keep, I think it was about 200 people safe in a building before hatching an escape plan out of the country. So really, really just an impressive young man. 
I mean, it's fascinating to hear the stories of especially the Asian immigrants into Ukraine and how they're balancing the playing cricket, which obviously is so important to them. It helps stave off homesickness, but also with um, bringing their Ukrainian friends and playing against Ukrainians who are coming completely new to the sport. So in that vein, could you talk a little bit about Oleksandr Romanenko? Why is he important and why is his story so interesting? So Alexander Sasha Romanenka was the cricket team's wicketkeeper, and he was one of the guys who saw the Australian playing in Kahalik and assumed it was some kind of combat, came to play, and just a, a Ukrainian lad who made cricket his, his main hobby and really fell in love with it. But being in his late 20s, when the war began, and again, Russian troops arrived in Bilotserkva, where he lives, he first signed up to the territorial defense with his brother. So the same as all Ukrainians who woke up at whatever it was, 4 a.m. on that morning, he rushed to the to sign up for the territorial defense and later enrolled in the Ukrainian army. So I interviewed him as he was moving through Donbass. He was serving in Bakhmut, was part of the counteroffensive in, in Belgorod. And we just had this very intense conversation over the months of, on the one hand, telling me his cricketing stories of, of great catches he's taken and favorite innings. But I was very conscious that he was telling me all this at the time he was serving on the front lines and in trenches. So he's the boy on the front cover of the book, because I, I thought that was the, the right thing to do. Oh, I hadn't realised that. That's, oh, that's really good to know. One of the moving things I thought Alexander told you was what cricket meant for him and how he'd fitted it into his life and the kind of values he'd taken from it. Before we move on to the, the final character I think we should discuss, would you talk a little bit about that? That was also fascinating, the way that Alexander told me that the 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 skills, the life skills he learned from playing cricket had put him in good stead to to, to fight in a war. So he, he told me that through cricket and through the tutelage of the Australian pastor in his town, he learned self-belief, courage, I, I forget what other qualities, but he just, he, he kept coming back to the idea that a life in cricket had prepared him in some way for, for life on the front lines and uh, yeah, just made him a better person. And of course, cricket is not just for the men. So let's talk about, finally, Anna Morochkina. What's her story? And again, I think she embodies a different a different story. We've got Fessel Kasim, who moved to Ukraine. We've got Alexander, who is native Ukrainian-born, who's now serving in the army. Anna has a different story. Could you tell us about her? Anna's story is equally breathtaking. Just an absolutely incredible story. So Anna left Vinnytsia in uh, central Ukraine and took her young daughter to Croatia where she ended up in, in Zagreb. And one evening she saw just some young kids in the park playing cricket and decided to join in with them. And Anna became first a cricket tragic, so fell in love with the history of the game and everything. But Anna became one of the coaches and she used these cricket playing evenings in Zagreb, firstly to ensure that the children, the kind of refugee Ukrainian kids, had a, a place to exercise, make friends, socialize, you know, just in, in a new country. It also gave the children's mothers, who had obviously escaped from Ukraine, gave them a chance to get together on the boundary, share information about the new city. So these evenings, it was just a, a way that cricket for, for children was a bit of trauma counselling, trauma therapy, a way to bring a Ukrainian community together abroad through cricket, which I thought was just absolutely amazing. And what's, Jonathan, before I hand over, because I know Joe's got some questions as well, what's the status of the game in the country now? I mean, you, you write, you talk in your book about Ukraine's slow progress towards sort of in, international recognition and joining the, the ICC. Where is that story now? So um, a theme of the book is Ukraine's mission to join the ICC, which is the world governing body, to become an international cricket team and, and recognised. They were so, so close when the war began and they were rejected, basically. So no one right now is quite sure what's going to happen with cricket in Ukraine. I, I think there's a lot of belief among kind of Ukraine's cricketers that, that one day this all might start again and, and they can have a team again. And certainly people like Anna inside Ukraine want to help children recover from their traumas by playing cricket together. But I think the, the war has to perhaps end before that happens and no one knows when it will happen. Yeah. Hi, Jonathan. Joe here. I was wondering if you can talk us through some of Ukraine's star players and just tell us it's one thing we saw, we saw I think the USA won the their first game in the 2020 World Cup against Pakistan yesterday. And it's moments like that where the minnows come up against the old greats of the game and win. And so what sort of the star players and how is the quality of the game out there? The quality is really high. And I, I was so surprised doing my research. And I, I came across kind of videos and Facebook videos and footage of these guys playing. And they were real cricketers, really talented guys. I mentioned Faisal Kasim earlier. He was the team's opening bowler. And... 
he's only kind of quite young now, but when he was a teenager, he was quite close to becoming a, a professional. Among the Ukrainian guys, their star, star batter was a guy called Yuri Zahorsky. And he went toe to toe with the Indian guys and, and scored 50s and um, became a, a good, good batter in his own right. So I think realistically, Ukraine would, would have been one of the weaker international teams, but certainly talented guys in the team. So, yeah, I think it's fascinating. Me and David were joking earlier, or maybe not actually joking, about setting up a tour of some sort to try and organise a team to play the Ukrainian team. I presume they have it. Do they have a national team now where they club together all the best club players and try and get them playing? They could certainly organise a team in exile. Perhaps we can talk about this because one of my dreams would be, I mean, perhaps in a, in a charity context, raise money, have a fundraiser, have a, a Ukrainian cricket team play against a, a guest team somewhere in Europe. I know that there are Ukrainian cricketers now are in Georgia, Tbilisi, I'm sure some are in Croatia, and others further afield, places like Canada and back in India. But I think one amazing way that the Ukrainian cricket team could contribute to the war effort would be if we, we were to organise a match somewhere in Europe, if it's Croatia or, or somewhere. Yeah, definitely worth thinking about. I'd, I'd love it to happen. Absolutely. I mean, Joe, I was not joking. So let's make this happen. If you're listening and you would like to help or have ideas about where this could happen, please do get in touch. The email address is, of course, in the show notes, as always. Jonathan, just to end this, what does the story of cricket in Ukraine show us about the country and how it's changed over the past sort of 20, 30 years? In writing the book, I cover different parts of Ukrainian history. The late 90s that were relatively prosperous, moving into Yanukovych's time, which was perhaps less of a good time, and finally onto, onto the war. I think it's a great sporting story. and I wanted to write a, a lovely kind of cricketing, cricketing, cricketing story. But I hope readers will read the book and appreciate that beyond the horrible images we're seeing right now and stories of just absolute destruction, that Ukraine has a, a real living, breathing culture, even as something as quirky as having a national cricket team. And I think the tragedy is that you could probably write a book about the Ukrainian dog grooming team or the Ukrainian cake decorating team and other things like that. But because of this horrible invasion, life has been put on hold. And I would love people who buy and read this book to understand a little bit more that just there is a real country just beyond the beyond the wreckage. Jonathan Campion, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for your time. And of course, to our listeners, we'll put a link to the book in the show notes. So do go and find it there. Coming up, we hear Jonathan and Joe's final thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan and Joe, for your time. Let's go to our final thoughts. Jonathan, we'll come to you um, at the end as our guest, but Joe Barnes, would you like to go first? Thanks, Jonathan. That is combining two of my great passions in life of Ukraine and and cricket. So yeah, can't wait to read the book. But yeah, for my final thought, I was looking with the EU elections ahead. The Dutch voted last night. Most of countries will, other countries vote on Saturday, but everyone will be finished by Sunday when the sort of the polls are announced. And what I've noticed is a clear trend the far right, the populist, the nationalist leaders, who you would often associate with being pro-Russian or Russian-leaning, are starting to show more support for Ukraine. So that, so Vladimir Zelensky, he was speaking in the French National Assembly this morning, and he was given, as he's always given, a standing ovation at these sort of his parliamentary speeches. And, and if you scrolled through the crowd, you would have noticed Marine Le Pen, who is the leader of the French for the national rally, if we were to translate it into English. And yeah, and she was sitting there joining and it got me thinking. And yeah, it's like there is this clear trend of the far right populist nationalist leaders showing Ukraine support. And it is actually what I devise as a route to the top table of Europe. And let's use Italy's Georgia Maloney as a best case a demonstration of this. Um, she is and has been since taking power a staunch backer of Kiev. She's a staunch backer of NATO, but despite being the leader of the Brothers of Italy, the Italian to English translation, which is Mussolini's former party, is now a fully fledged member of the European Union's mainstream. So from that perspective, you look at Maloney's support for Ukraine has given her the credibility to sit alongside Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission's president, and help dictate the EU's responses to both migration and discussions over net zero. And she's procured concessions in Italy's favour. Contrast that 
with Viktor Orban, when you look at him, and he shares these same concerns about migration, about net zero, climate change rules, etc. But look where the guy who doesn't support Ukraine, and is in most people's eyes openly hostile to Ukraine, he's not afforded the same status or the same talking points as the likes of Georgia Maloney. So Le Pen in France, that party is due to be the biggest national delegation from France in the European Parliament. So if she wants to be taken seriously by other Europeans and actually use her far right leanings to bring the the EU um, away from the political centre, bring it more to the right, supporting Ukraine is one of those keys to access. Um, another example of this is Gert Wilders in, in the Netherlands. His Freedom Party won the most recent Dutch election. But he, to form an unprecedented right-wing coalition headed up by his Freedom Party, has vowed to keep on the Netherlands' great support for Ukraine, despite previously being described as pro-Russian. So I just think it's an interesting trend how Ukraine and support for Ukraine is meeting uncharted territory as people use it as leverage for their own domestic issues uh, in Europe. Well, thank you so much, Joe Barnes. Jonathan Campion, as our guest, would you like the very final thoughts? One question from me. If we can organise this charity match, what ground in the UK would you like it to take place at? Well, I should mention, of course, that for as long as the war is going on, Ukrainian men have restrictions on leaving the country. So it's only right that the guy on the front of the book, the keeper, Romanenko, should play. So the war has to end before that happens. But uh, ideally, there'd be a game somewhere in London that kind of accessible to have people able to come to watch. And let's hope that it happens before too long, because that would mean that the war's finally over. So uh, let's hope in a couple of years, or hopefully less, players like Romanenko, Vital Kasim, Zahorsky will be finding playing cricket somewhere in England. And uh, maybe the course could be the, the reconstruction efforts after the war that can help to build country again. Jonathan Campion, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Rachel Porter. And the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.